Okay. Um, Kelvin Chin is the executive director and founder of the Overcoming the Fear of Death Foundation and TurningWithin.org nonprofits. His nonprofits take a non religious approach to helping people reduce and eliminate their fears. For over 40 years, Kelvin has helped people in two areas. Um, number one, how to reduce fears about death and dying. And two, how to meditate effortlessly to reduce anxieties and increase coping abilities. He has taught meditation to more than 5,000 people since the 1970s in schools, businesses, the U.S. Army, and at West Point. And he has trained doctors, <clears throat> nurses, therapists, and home health care workers in end-of-life practices and meditation. Today, he is going to focus on the first area with us, and he has told me that if we want him to come back another time and discuss teaching us his turning within meditation technique for free, he would be happy to do so, and we would be so honored and grateful for that. Um, his book, Overcoming the Fear of Death, through each of the four main belief systems is an Amazon bestseller. He has generously offered to donate a copy to each of us um, who has participated here today. And if you would like one, just let myself or Dan know or the bereavement department. Kelvin lives in Los Angeles and teaches worldwide, 43 countries so far. He is a graduate of Dartmouth College, Yale Graduate School and Boston College Law School. Uh, the bereavement department is proud to present and we give a warm welcome uh, to Kelvin Chin uh, to the VNA family. Welcome, Kelvin. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much. Great to see everybody here. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I want to talk a little bit, so Dan and I were talking a little bit beforehand about formatting. And so I, I just want to talk for about a half an hour-ish or something like that, 30, 35 minutes, something like that. I want to leave a lot of time at the end for Q&A because I'm big on trying to give people tips and approaches to thinking about these things that you can hopefully in a practical way walk away with something that you can apply in your various practices sooner rather than later, okay? So I want to tailor this to depending on what your needs are. So I want to leave a lot of time at the end for Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so first, I want to just acknowledge and you know, say to all of you that I know that you each are experts and trained in the area of bereavement. This is why we're having this conversation with this particular group, obviously. So I'm not here to teach you what you already know, uh, hopefully. Um, what I hope to do today is give you perhaps a different way, uh, maybe a different way of looking at the, the area of death and dying, um, and, and specifically in terms of how we as caregivers uh, talk with patients and clients of ours who may not share the same beliefs we do about death and dying. So as you hear me go through what I'm going to discuss with you today, that's the lens I want you to keep, you know, reminding yourself that you're looking through. So, you know, we, it's easier for us, obviously, to talk with friends, family, patients, clients who share our religious or cultural beliefs about how we think about death and dying. But what about the ones that don't? You know, so that's, that's the, that's the uh, kind of the, the gap that I want to try to help you guys fill in and increase your comfort zone speaking with those folks who may not share the same beliefs that you do without us having to get into a whole academic discussion, which we're not going to do, about all the different thousands of religious and cultural beliefs that are out there. I'm going to distill it down to you in a, in a nutshell form that I, I've come up with that I think captures the, es the essence and will give you some tools to kind of to, to, to work with. Okay, that's, that's the framework that we're, we're looking through today. Okay, um, so the, the whole idea is, you know, not stepping on the patient or the client's toes, culturally and religiously, and yet still helping them, ideally, reduce their fears about death and dying, making them a little bit more comfortable. That's, that's all of our roles, what you and I do together in this field. Um, all right, so a little bit of background on me in terms of my story uh, with, with, with death and dying and so forth, and you know, what got me into this. Because as you heard uh, Sharon say, you know, I, have this, I have a background in uh, uh, you know, educationally in a lot of different areas, 
um, and quite frankly, none of which <laughs> is in the deaf and dying arena. My deaf and dying experience, yeah, I, yes, I've taken some workshops over the years, but my academic experience is not what I was thinking about, you know, at the time, oh, I'm going to get into deaf and dying, um, helping people. What catapulted me into this area was the death of my mom. And it was really, I was very close to my mom. And she died very young. And I was young at the time. And I'm sure many of you have lost loved ones, whether it's your parents, grandparents, children. That's so horrific. I can't even, I, I help a lot of parents who've lost children. Um, but I lost my mom when we were both young. And she was only around 50 years old. And she had an illness. And it was one of these things, without getting into the details, it was an illness that which she was asymptomatic the whole time, almost right up until the end. And then, boom, she was in the hospital, and then she was gone. So it was not quite like losing somebody in a car accident, but it was almost, you know? And so the shock to me, the grief, the grieving, the overwhelming sadness that I had, and so forth, that you all deal with, with your patients, and clients and maybe have had to deal with it personally at some point in your lives. You know what I'm talking about. Um, at the same time, understand that I'd already been meditating for 12 years when this happened, okay? Um, I'd already been teaching meditation for eight or nine years when my mom died. I learned when I was a teenager to meditate um, about two or three years after the Beatles learned. Um, I learned TM, Transcendental Meditation. I studied personally with Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi. Those of you may, who are old enough, <laughs> or if you're a Beatles fan, you know that you know, they studied with Maharishi and so forth. And I have friends who were with the Beatles and Maharishi in India uh, before a couple few years before I learned in 1970. Uh, I was an international leader in his organization for about 10 years and so forth before I left the organization when they went in a different direction. My point is that I was well versed in helping myself cope with stress, but this was my mother who died, right? It's a different level, it's a different degree. And so I went through a very severe, significant grief, grieving process. And that's what catapulted me into thinking about death and dying. It would be like, I was in school at the time, I was in law school at the time. And so I'd be walking down the hallway, and you know how you, you know how we all do this, you know, you're at stop and shop supermarket or something in New Jersey, and somebody comes up to you and they say, oh, how are you doing? And you go, oh, oh, yeah, I'm doing okay. Even if you're not, you know, because maybe you don't want to get into it, maybe you don't know them that well, or maybe you just don't have the time. So we say that all the time, right? Oh, yeah, I'm doing okay, I'm doing fine, even if we're not. Well, one day at school, a friend of mine came up to me and he said, hey, Kel, how you doing? And I said, well, I'm doing okay, but, you know, my mom just died. I just blurted it out or something. I just, I don't know why. And then, boom, you know how it's a little self-disclosure? It just opens up the door, the floodgates open if on them. And then they go, whoa, your, dad, your mom died? Oh, my brother just was, died. He was in this terrible motorcycle accident in Utah. Well, they just start telling you stuff, people. Start telling you stuff. That's how I got into this. So I really got pulled into the death and dying arena by really a personal need to help myself because I was in such grief. I started realizing, well, I started talking about this with people that started helping me. You know, I, I wish I had known about some of you <laughs> at the time who were therapists and trained in this, but I didn't, you know, I was just like, I was just clueless. Uh, so I was, it was my way of helping myself. That's how I got into this. And what I noticed was as people started feeling better talking with me, and I feel it felt better talking with them, they started referring people to talk with me. And then nights and weekends for the last 35 years, now I'm doing it full time in the last 10 years, but you know, for 35 years, it was nights and weekends, people calling me up, I didn't know, and they say, Kel, I just talked to somebody and they said, you should, I should talk to you about you know, my mother who just died or my father just died, whatever. And that's how it started and it just snowballed. Uh, but what I noticed, and this brings us to the conversation we want to talk about and focus on today together, um, what I noticed was that if there was just one or two, you know, two of us talking, it was a fairly intimate conversation and 
you know, sensitive, empathetic, empathetic, and so forth. But if there were two or three or four or six people join the conversation, it started to get a little dicey sometimes where people would start to foist and push their views on the other people in the group about what they thought happened after you die or how they thought you should deal with the death and dying issue and, and so forth. And so I thought about this and I said, this is crazy. We need to talk more openly about this, not shut each other down. And so that's when I came up with these four belief systems that Sharon referenced that I talk about in my book that we're gonna talk about today in some detail, okay? We're gonna use that as a filter, as a, as a reference point to, 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 to look through these four belief systems. Um, and so, you know, the context is so that you all can take some things from what I'm gonna talk with you about these four belief systems and hopefully apply them in your practices to help you uh, with your patients and clients. Okay, that's the filter I want you to be listening through. Again, just a reminder, okay, when I go through these four belief systems and we'll go through each one separately. But let me just list them first for you, okay? So uh, remember, these are four belief systems that are not religious, they're not cultural beliefs, but they are the underlying beliefs that underlie and support all the religious and cultural beliefs. That's why I said earlier that you don't have to learn all, all the different variations of Buddhism. You know, you don't have to learn all the different variations of this sect or this group and so forth. These are the four underpinnings that everybody falls somewhere in these four categories. The first category, I call it the science belief, the first belief, the science belief. All right, what's that belief? That belief is no afterlife. The, the mind and the body are one. The brain is the mind. That's that, the science belief, okay? That was my dad's belief. Um, the second belief, uh, and we'll come back and we'll talk, as I said, about each of these in a minute. The, the second belief is a belief in an afterlife, but fear. There's fear, some fear is associated with a belief in an afterlife. So I, I sometimes refer to it as the fear of continued existence. So it's different from the first belief, right? The first belief, no afterlife. This one, belief in an afterlife of some sort, but there's some fear and the fear could be from many, many different sources. Um, very often people will sometimes say um, the fear of the unknown or fear of uncertainty, fear of oblivion, fear of nothingness. Those to me are all various ways of articulating this same second belief system, okay? Um, afterlife with no fear, that's the third belief system. So they believe in an afterlife, but there's no fear. Third belief system. Fourth belief system is reincarnation. Past lives, future lives, belief that they can come back in a different body, the, the mind, the soul, the spirit, the consciousness. By the way, when you hear me use the word mind, in my talks, I'm referring to not just our focused conscious mind that is listening to this talk right now, but I'm referring to the, our big mind too, okay? So you can think, you could, you, could, you could use a synonym, soul, spirit, consciousness, same thing, because you understand that I'm, I'm trying to uh, use non-culturally or religiously loaded language because I work across all cultures, 43 countries so far, and, um, and religions, and, and some people are atheists, some people are very devout in various religions, it doesn't matter, I help everybody. So I use the word mind. So those are the four belief systems. Everybody falls somewhere in that spectrum. Now, um, and some people may be hybrids, and we're gonna talk about a hybrid, and I'm gonna give you a specific example of somebody whom I helped, um, who was a hybrid, and we'll, uh, I'll tell you that story in a minute. But, um, Let's just go through um, some of these belief systems. So the first one, the science belief, the belief in no afterlife, my dad's belief, right? My dad was a scientist, he was an engineer, very, very, you know, methodical and very, very sure, very sure-minded, very certain about what his beliefs were. These are his beliefs, that was it, ironclad. I don't know how many people uh, have engineers in their family, but I come up from a clan not just an immediate family. I come from a clan of engineers. I am the non-engineer in the whole first cousin, second cousins. I'm the non-engineer guy. Anyway, um, very ironclad in my dad's belief system. 
Um, so first, let's analyze that a little bit. The fear uh, around this, this, this fear of, um, of death, where you have belief in no afterlife. Well, let, first let's talk about fear. What is fear? I define fear in the following way. Fear is the emotion caused by the anticipation of unhappiness. The emotion caused by the anticipation of unhappiness. Makes sense, right? So if somebody says to me, they have this first belief system fear, the no afterlife, I don't believe in an afterlife, I believe my brain shuts off, my mind shuts off, then I say, well, you know, if you think about that, if fear is the anticipation of unhappiness, the emotion caused by the anticipation of unhappiness, then you should have no fear because you're telling me that you, after your body dies, you should have no fear of death because there's no experience. And they usually say, oh yeah, you're right. But I still, here's what happens when, you know, if you, were, if, if you had somebody talk, you were talking to somebody like my dad, uh, who was really ironclad and firm in their belief, you, they would be like my dad, and he did not have a fear of death at all. He was all in, living life, and that was it, because he really did have the first belief system. Most people have a hybrid. My experience talking to thousands of people um, over the last 35 years, most people are a hybrid. Most people, even if they say they have the first belief system, the science belief, they, then they'll say, but I'm, but I'm just not sure. Or, or I'm afraid of nothingness, or I'm afraid that, you know, after I die, I'm just going to be in a void, you know, outer space or something, in a void. So, so those are all different ways of people expressing what I call the second belief system. And I point that out to them, that they may be a little bit of a fence sitter. And it's okay. It's very normal. We're not sure. I tell people all, all the time, I say, look, we're going to know when we know. You know when we're going to know is that at that most intimate moment of each of our lives, each of us, each human being's life, at that most intimate moment, at the moment our physical biological body shuts off. And I say intimate in the sense that it's ourselves with ourselves, really, right? That's what I mean by intimate. You know, that's when we're going to know. And there are very few things in life that are binary. You know, it's either it's black and white, it's on or off. And we're either, our mind is going to either continue, our consciousness is either going to continue or it's not going to continue. And I tell people that. And if it doesn't continue, then everything is moot. Everything is, what you're talking about is irrelevant, right? But I want to prepare people for that moment to not be fearful, all right? That's my goal in my work. And then if they do continue, because that's when we're going to know, right? If they do continue, my work now is to help them be less fearful in the continual present. And their continual present will be then, right? Our continual present, that's why I call it continual present is always changing, right? So that will be their continual present if they do continue. And I tell them that right up front. So I said, I can't guarantee one way or the other, but you're going to know and I'm going to know, we're all going to know at that most intimate moment. So let's live our lives as fear-free as possible starting now because this is where we're living always in the continual present. Let's help, help each other enjoy our lives in the present. So again, back to this belief system number one, you can see how fear then would be illogical, right, in belief system number one, okay? But if they still have fear, then they are, um, you, know, a, a, you know, a belief system number two, person. Um, so again, um, I'm going to tell you some stories in the context of our discussion today. And I want you to, I'm just going to plant a seed in your head. Some of the experiences that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about some near-death experiences and so forth that people have had, um, that I talk about in my book and so forth. Even if you have not had a near-death experience or some of the experiences I'm going to talk about with you today, feel free. I'm giving you full 100% permission to use me in your practices when you're talking to people and say, you know what? I don't know if, this is, if there's any truth to this, but this guy, Kelvin Chin, did a seminar with us and he said X, Y, Z. So feel free to use me that way 
I'm all about helping you help other people reduce their fears as much as humanly possible. That's what my nonprofit work is all about worldwide. Okay? So, um, another, another tip I want to share with you before I get into a story I want to tell you um, is I suggest that we always ask, and you probably already know this, you do this probably already in your practices, but just to maybe overstate the obvious, I suggested that we always start by asking our patients and clients to tell us, um, you, know, you know, what are you afraid of and what happens, what do you think happens after we die? If, there, if that's the topic of your conversation and if that's, you know, what you think is presenting as a, as a professional, you know, in other words, ask them. I always ask them, my, my clients, when they call me up from around the world, tell me about your story. Tell me what your thinking is. Tell me what your fear is. Tell me what your belief system is. I am not there, and I know you guys aren't there either, you folks, you know, to, to promote our belief systems on them. We are there as caregivers to support them. So I want you to understand that I understand that and that that's how I practice as well. And so um, you'll hear this in this story that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you uh, about, share with you right now from my book. This is a copy of my book, by the way. Um, and as Sharon said, I literally mean this. If you want a free copy of my book, you just let Sharon or Dan know and uh, let the bereavement department know and, and, and we'll send you a copy of my book. Okay. Um, again, it's a non-religious approach to help people uh, reduce and overcome their fears about death and dying. There's a chapter in here, it's called Jimmy Still Wondered, okay? Jimmy Still Wondered. So when you get the book, you can read the more detailed version of this story, but I'm going to give you some highlights of this, okay? Because this will illustrate to you how I have worked with at least one of my uh, clients here. Actually, he was a friend of mine. You'll hear the context of the story, but, you know, this is how I, I work with my clients who has, um, he's a hybrid, you'll see, okay? So um, between the first and the second belief systems, which is where most people are, okay? We'll talk about the last one. You may think, you know, the third belief system, they don't have a fear of death and dying. That is the third belief system. But the fourth belief system, people wonder, well, reincarnation, would they have fears about death and dying? The short answer is yes. We'll get to that in a little bit, all right? You may think, oh, that's illogical. That doesn't make sense. Well, they still have fears. Um, Jimmy still wondered, all right? So at this point in, in my story, in my life story with Jimmy, let me just tell you, um, Jimmy was a head cancer and he was uh, under, a, he had a lot of chemotherapy for at least a year before I met him, okay? And then when I met him, it was celebratory time because it was the doctor who just said, oh, you can go off chemo. Now, your tumor, it, it, its cancer seems to be in remission. Great. So it was celebratory time when I first met him. Then within a two or three month period, things started to degrade again and so forth. And he went in, got his blood tested, saw markers again, the cancer had come back. So I'm sure you've seen this story, similar stories uh, before. And so um, I sat with him one morning about a month before he passed away. Um, we knew it was nearing the end, but of course, as you guys know, many of you have been with people who have died. Uh, you don't know till you know. And so it turned out to be about a month before. And I, I knelt down next to him. And, and keep in mind, this Jimmy is 6'4", 275 pound, Vietnam War vet, an army lifer, a big guy. Uh, for those of you who know uh, what a Cobra attack helicopter was or is, uh, that's what he flew. He was a pilot in Vietnam. Um, big, tough guy. Um, and he was bedridden at this point. You know, he could only get up uh, to his walker to get to and from the bathroom and even hardly that. Um, so I knelt down next to his bed. I taught him to meditate. And then after I taught him to meditate, we talked for a few minutes about death because he, at that point he knew he was going. Um, he was, he was going to transition, you know, at some point in the foreseeable future. He knew he was, he was, this was nearing the end. 
And I asked him what he thought happened after, after we die. And he said, I think that's it, nothing. When we're done, we're done. So that was Jimmy's exact language of describing the first belief system I told you, right? No afterlife, okay? The science belief. And I said to Jimmy, that's what my father believed too. And then I described to Jimmy this first belief system idea. This was about a year before I wrote the book. Um, but Jimmy said, but I still wonder. He said, I still wonder. And I asked him, you wonder about what? You see, I didn't want to put words or thoughts in his mind. I didn't want to lead him. So I asked him questions to help me clarify what he was saying to make sure that I understood what he meant without me planting and assuming what he meant, what I thought he meant, right? And he said, I wonder if that's what will happen, if I will actually just die or if something else will happen. And I said, like what? He said, I don't know, like, Maybe I might not die, he said. I said, oh, so you think your mind is probably going to stop when you die, but you wonder what may happen if it doesn't. He said, yeah. So you see what I did? I'm just demonstrating something that you probably know how to do, which is called reframing. I took the words that I didn't lead him. I sort of led him, but I let him tell me more details, right? I didn't just assume that I knew what he said. I let him tell me, and then I reframed and summed up what he said in a, in a coherent, logical way that clarified it for him. I do that a lot with my clients. So a lot of what I do is help them clarify their thinking because that alone helps reduce their fears. Because many times people come to me and they think, oh, I have a fear of death, I have a fear of death, I have a fear of death. And it turns out they don't actually have a fear of death in the way that we're talking about today. They have a fear of the process of dying, which is a different fear in which we can talk about, but that's different. And so I help them get clarity. That alone frees up some of that energy. The clarity frees up some of that energy that's being dissipated in their kind of being in this maelstrom of fear, you see? So, so I said, oh, I summed that up. And, so, and then I held his hand. So again, this is difficult to do with the COVID situation and so forth, but once you can get more face-to-face -face in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a touching way with some of your clients, you know, I, I, I sometimes do that. It depends on the client and so forth and so on. You're professionals, you know, you know you need to make certain decisions around that. But I held his hand. I just touched Jimmy's hand as he was lying in bed. And by doing so, I could kind of sense his tension, you know? And so he was a little bit tense when I was talking with him, okay? So we talked some more. And, um, and I said, so how do you feel about that? And he said, yeah, I still wonder about it sometimes, but I'm not afraid of it. At least he said that even though his hand, the tension in his hand to me, I think belied the fact that he was a little bit, a little anxious, right? So um, then I went in and I told him a story. And I told him this other story. It's another story that's in my book, the details of which, again, are there, which when you get the copy of the book, you can read the, the longer version. But the short version is, um, and I told Jimmy the, the very short version, which was uh, I had a friend in college who said he died uh, when he was eight years old. And what happened was, it's called Henry's tonsils, if you're looking for it in the book when you get the book, Henry's tonsils. And uh, my friend Henry... Uh, told me what, when uh, he was eight years old, he had his tonsils out. And many of you have probably had your tonsils out. It's like not a major uh, risky uh, surgical procedure, right? A lot of people have their tonsils out. Well, he had his tonsils out, no problem. He went home and his mother felt badly for him. So she had a whole bunch of Toll House chocolate chip cookies made for him. And evidently, some of them we're a little bit overcooked, too crispy, okay? So Henry is scarfing down these Toll House cookies and rips out his sutures in the back of his throat, okay? Now he's hemorrhaging. He's eight years old. He's telling me this when we were in college. So we were about 20 years old. He's telling me this. But when he was eight years old, he's hemorrhaging on his living room floor. On the ceiling, he told me. He's up on the ceiling. 
So this is a near-death experience, NDE. You may have heard that acronym before. So this was his version of an NDE. He said he was on the ceiling, looking down, his mind, his consciousness was on the ceiling. But, you know, he just said, oh, I was on the ceiling, you know, looking down at my eight-year-old eight, eight, eight body, and my mom's freaking out, screaming, crying, you know, and she can't tell that I'm bleeding because it's internal, but I'm unconscious. And, um, and she calls the doctor, the doctor comes, and he heard everything that everybody said. And the doctor, this is, those of you who are old enough uh, uh, to know, remember, you know, back in the day, doctors did house calls, you know, in the 60s and the 70s and the 50s, you know, doctors would do house calls. And, um, and so he uh, shows up at the house right away. He's not that far away. And he, he checks Henry out on the living room floor. He says, it's going to take too long to get the ambulance here. I'm taking you right now, uh, taking your son right now. So the three of them get in the car. Henry's in, and now he's on the ceiling of the car. He's, he's still looking at his mom's freaking out. And he, he told me, he kept remembering thinking, mom, calm down. I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, he doesn't realize that, you know, he's never had a separation of mind body experience before. So he, he doesn't realize that, that, you know, his body is not okay. Anyway, so the hospital, he's on the ceiling of the surgery room. He remembers who's wearing what, which necktie was poking up, the color of the necktie, the doctor underneath the, you know, the coat, the surgeon and so forth and so on. All of that, he came back and he told his mom when he was eight years old, right after, right after the experience. So that's an ex example of an NDE. I told Jimmy. Okay, so back to the Jimmy story that happened in 2015, the story with Jimmy. I told that story to Jimmy. Um, and when I told him that story, I said to him, I said, um, I told him that I already told you, which is, you know, we won't know till we know, right? At that moment when we die. But I said, just in case <clears throat> your, your, uh, your mind does continue after, after your body dies, like in the Henry story, which, by the way, Jimmy said, wow, that's a wild story. <laughs> he said, that's a crazy, story. I said, that's a wild story. Uh, uh, and I said, just in case you continue after your body dies, what will continue? Obviously not your physical, biological body that has died of cancer, but what will continue is your mind. Your, and what is your mind or your consciousness? It is then energy. It must be energy because we are atoms, molecules, energy, right? So that must be energy that continues. And I said, um, um, he said, that's an interesting story. Wow, pretty wild stuff. And his hand seemed to relax just slightly in my hand, right? And he died, as I said, a month later, and I was standing at his bedside when he died um, alongside with his wife and his daughter, Kim. Uh, and he died, he seemed to die peacefully. Um, you know, even though he had a little bit of the second belief system and the first belief system, I think. So that's a good example of a hybrid, a hybrid example. Okay. Um, so what about belief system number four? We'll skip belief system number three, because that's the one where they believe they may even be looking forward to going to heaven. So it's a non-issue, right? But what about belief system four, uh, reincarnation? Well, um, if somebody believes in reincarnation, can they be afraid of death and dying? Absolutely, yes. I have many, many clients in Asia, and I know in New Jersey, from talking with uh, Dan and, and Sharon, I think they told me that you know there's there's many South Asians living uh, that are probably constituents of you know patients and clients in your 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 uh, VNA constituency, um, and so uh, many of them may I don't know. Many of them may have reincarnation beliefs. And can they be fearful? Absolutely, yes. You should understand that I, I have many, many clients from uh, India, Bangladesh, all through Southeast Asia and so forth, China, Japan. So, um, and, but the beliefs may be articulated slightly differently. Um, they may be articulated in terms of a fear of, of, of uncertainty of what form that I can come back with. Uh, it come back in, uh, in, in another lifetime? Or will I be able to see my loved ones in another lifetime? Or will I never be able to see them again? 
people can have any of the other, the first two belief systems or the second, second or the fourth belief system and, be, and, and believe that or have that fear as well, that concern. Um, so I always, I always tell people the issue is personal choice. My experience, um, personal experience, without getting into you know, details, I've had many experiences on the other side. And my experience on the other side is that our mind does continue. Again, I don't tell my clients this unless they ask me directly, um, especially if they're a first belief system believer. I don't want them to think that I'm trying to you know, persuade them in any way. But if they go there and they ask me directly, I will tell them. Um, so I've had experiences on the other side. I've had a near-death experience myself where I almost drowned when I was 20, see, I was 21 years old when I almost drowned off of San Diego in a rip current. If you know what a rip current is, it's a river in the ocean that's moving very fast and it can pull you out very, very far in the ocean. And um, I was out about two miles, they think. Um, so uh, in a matter of maybe 30 seconds. So I almost drowned. Um, so I've had my own experiences and for those of you who are curious about um, this reincarnation fourth belief system, I suggest that offline separately go to the University of Virginia Medical School website and then plug in the search window on the University of Virginia Medical School website. Just type in past lives or reincarnation. Since 1967, they have had a department at the medical school at the University of Virginia solely devoted to this. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, 1960, that's a long time. It's been around and they have collected, they have 2,700 to 3,000 cases, case studies of mostly children from two to five years old, generally two to five years old, sometimes as old as seven years old, but then they start forgetting. And these two and three year old kids, you'll read these stories and you kind of go, how does that kid know how to play Chopin at two years old on a violin and they've never had violin lessons. You know, how does that kid know how to fly an airplane, how to do the, the, the check, you know, the mechanical check, where the instruments are and so forth and so on at three years old, never been to an airport before, et cetera. Never seen a movie about flying airplanes, okay? There's a lot of studies like that, and um, or case studies, uh, case studies about that at, at the University of Virginia Medical School. Um, <clears throat> people talking about being in different countries, and yet they were born in Louisiana or Ohio or wherever, and they've never left the United States before, and talking about being in different countries, and then giving detailed, not just details like like. Uh, tourist book details, but where the river bends, where this stream bends outside this village that is like unknown to you and me, that stream that doesn't even show up on a map and so forth, and what happened at the bend of that stream, whatever, you know, when you're two or three or four years old in the United States. So there's a lot of case studies like that in at the University of Virginia Medical School. I always say, is it absolute proof in reincarnation? I don't think there's ever any absolute proof, but it's certainly a strong data point that seems to point in that direction. How else could these kids know these things and so forth? Um, <clears throat> so again, we're gonna open up the questions now and we can cover any number of points in greater detail or new points in the Q&A now. But just a quick summary. Um, Again, I encourage you to use this, use the four belief systems that I've given you as a way to, to look through a filter, uh, to weigh, you know, like glasses, uh, you know, a way to look through um, into the death and dying arena in a non-religious way that may help your clients hopefully navigate and feel more comfortable with their own deaths or their, the loved one's deaths who they've who, who they just lost and you're, you're coming in as the bereavement person. You know, again, <clears throat> reminder, <clears throat> we are caregivers. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are caregivers. We're not there to change their religious or cultural beliefs, but instead we're, this, we're there to support theirs, whatever theirs is, and to reduce their fears and comfort them at that most challenging time 
you know, at end of life or for the folks who have lost a loved one uh, at that most challenging time in their lives. Um, so I always ask by starting them out with questions, open questions, what do you think? And then I tailor my comments accordingly as we discussed today. So, um, questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kelvin. Um, this is Sharon. We do have some questions here. Hmm. Uh, the majority of the clients we work hmm. with in our area hmm. are of a traditional Judeo-Christian background. Would there be yeah. key ideas, strategies to keep in mind in terms of the belief systems that correspond to these religious traditions and there yeah. was an addendum there, and perhaps for those who feel angry with God. So I guess that's a two-part. Yeah. So, so Judeo, um, most Jews do not believe in an afterlife in the way that Christians do. Okay? So you've got to be, be aware of that. <clears throat> Don't be going talking about heaven and so forth as you would with a Christian with a Jew. Okay? So I would... Um, um, stay more, lean more, if you're talking to, you know, somebody who has a Jewish background, I would stick more towards reducing the fears and so forth, um, more from a, um, not from a, a, a belief standpoint or um, um, an understanding about, oh, there may be an afterlife afterwards because they may not believe that. But the other thing is, even though you have a Jew, don't assume what I just said is true. Again, always, 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 Ask them, what do you believe? What do you think? Because I, I got to tell you, I've, I've, I have had helped many, many Jews or people who grew grown up Jewish who, who have changed their, morphed their belief systems because there are more liberal thinking Jews as well who don't believe in the more traditional Jewish view of no afterlife and so forth and no, um, you know, you know, resurrection of the body, you know, of the soul and the spirit and all of that, that the Christians do believe in. Okay. So you'll always have to ask, what do you believe? And, and don't assume based on what their religious belief is, you know, the doctrine from that religious, uh, the religious do doctrine. So I, I always ask them to, in this way, I say, tell me about your beliefs about death and dying. Now, and I say them, then I follow up and I say, tell me, now you may filter this through your religious uh, upbringing, but maybe it's the same. I say this, this is what I say to them explicitly. Maybe it's the same as when you were younger growing up. Maybe it's different. That's okay. I just want to know how are you thinking about it, mainly how you're thinking about it now, but you feel free to give me the journey if you like, if you would like to. So I ask them, I tell them that in a very open way so that they know that they can tell me whatever. Usually what they do is they go back and they tell me the journey because people want to tell their story. So that's my experience. But again, don't assume, okay? Now with Christian, um, they do, again, believe in heaven. And you notice that I call it afterlife, I don't call it heaven. With a Christian, I would call it heaven, okay? But if I'm doing a general public thing like this, or I'm generally talking to somebody and I don't know what their background is, I will call it, the afterlife, because I use neutral language, because I don't know where they're coming from, okay? So, um, um, but again, don't assume just because they're Christian, et cetera, et cetera. They may, they may have dropped that because for various reasons, they may have some barrier to that aspect of the doctrinal teaching, uh, even in, as a Christian. So you just don't, don't assume, okay? And, I, and uh, it, you know, it, it maybe, at some point, Sharon, um, I can tell another story about that, but I want to get through more questions. Um, was there, another, was there part? another part? Yeah, and how about how to deal with anger with God? Uh, uh, anger with God, yes. So I first ask people what their anger is about, okay? So um, I want to identify what their anger is. So does that person want to come back with a specific? so that I can help that person specifically? Or... No, it was just a two-part question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so, so here's the thing. Um, if, so first of all, again, don't assume that people believe in God, right? Because you don't know. So if they tell me they believe in God, then obviously I know that. Um, so if they told me that, I would say, well, God 
tell me about the God that you believe in. And usually they'll say, I believe in an all loving God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of thing, an all knowing God and so forth. And I, <clears throat> and I would say, well, yeah. And so um, would an all knowing God give us the, uh, would it, would, 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 does it make sense that an all knowing God would give us the ability to make choices in our lives? And I think most people would agree and say yes. Um, and, I, and, and, and then I point out to them sometimes, and again, it depends on the level of question. So all of this kind of discussion, I'm giving you- Oh, yes. So, um, Sonia is giving some more information okay. here. Yeah. Um, her client, she has an example of someone who is angry with God. The person is angry because God does not send her a sign that her husband is with God. Ah, okay. So here's what I would say to that person, um, that it's not up to God to send the sign um, that my experience, and you, and she, you can tell, and, and again, like I said, use me as your foil, say this this guy, Kelvin Chin told me this, you know, you don't have to own this uh, yourself, <laughs> uh, but that my experience is that the communication from this side to the other side to loved ones on the other side, first of all, understand it's a two-way street. So that means that we need to be open to receive and they have to be comfortable in sending, all right? And they have to be available to be to sending, to, be, to, to send us a message also. And um, there's a story I'll tell you in a second in my book about this. Um, the, 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 uh, and you also need to understand, there's a whole bunch of layers to this, that when people die and they're on the other side, my experience is that they're not just sitting around like I used to see, used to believe when I was as a kid, 1960s, watching the cartoons, you know, Merry Melodies, Looney Tunes cartoons on TV, <laughs> black and white TV, you know, that we had. Uh, you know, you die and you'd see the spirit, makes the soul kind of go up and sit on a cloud playing a harp. A lot of people think, of, like, you're not doing anything. In it. No, people are doing all kinds of fun things on the other side. So it, it doesn't mean that they don't love you and they're not hearing, they're not aware that you're sending them messages and so forth of love, but they may be actually be busy doing stuff. You know, it's no different. I tell people there's less difference from the other side than this side in, in a lot of different ways. There's obviously it's difference. You don't have a physical body, blah, blah, blah. But uh, in this way, because think about it on this side, Some, you, you, I have children. I don't hear from them for sometimes many, many days. You know, I'm a 26 year old, a 33, 32 year old. You think they don't love me? Yeah, they love me. But you know, it's like I reach out to them. Sometimes there's a delay. Sometimes there's a long delay. <laughs> they come back to me. You know, they're busy. It's no different. It's it that in that sense, it's no different. Um, you know, you know, that's that's the short answer, I think. Great. Um, another question here. Uh, what might be some of the common pitfalls that you would envision us as healthcare practitioners? coming face to face with in terms of facing death and dying on a daily basis. And perhaps this also goes, leads into your meditation, I'm thinking. Yeah, yes, yes. For ourselves, there's a number of challenges as we as caregivers have. And in you uh, have uh, uh, probably already experienced this book uh, already. First of all, as caregivers, what brings us to the table as caregivers? We care. Hello, you know, the first four letters of the word, right? Caregivers, we care about other human beings in a way that, that propels us into a profession. And some of you may be volunteers, but it's still your avocation. You're doing this even more so for, as, a, as a volunteer. You're doing this out of the goodness of your heart. You're volunteering. You know, so we are caregivers. We care. There's the, 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 the challenge there is as empaths, we are empathic people. We, we, the challenge is we need to be able to draw a distinction between our emotions and our patients or clients' emotions. They are, not this, they are not our emotions. Now, that does not mean that when we draw that distinction that we become Spock, <laughs> those of you who know Star Trek, you know, or robots. We don't become, you know, just, uh, you know, like Data in the more recent version of the Star Trek series. No, you know, we can still be very emotive and yet draw a distinction between our emotions 
and their emotions. They are not our emotions. That's, I think, the biggest challenge from, from most of us in the care, caregiving world. The other big challenge is self-care, is taking care of ourselves and, and not burning ourselves out, helping others, because we love helping others, okay? That's why we are caregivers. We do it because we love it, right? You know, we're not doing it because we want to make as much money as a hedge fund manager. And I don't have anything against hedge fund managers, but call a spade a spade. This is not that profession, okay? We are there because we enjoy helping people and that brings us great happiness and great joy, all right? That said, that said we need, we to, need be to be aware that we need to take care of ourselves. The more we take care of ourselves, the better we can take care of others, okay? And that, you're right, it brings us to the meditation in terms of self-care. And, you know, but I want to take more questions. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, for those, another question here. Uh, this is also from our bereavement counselor, uh, one of our bereavement counselors. For those clients who believe in the afterlife and reincarnation, would you encourage us suggesting literature or programs on YouTube about reincarnation? For example, books by Dolores Cannon? Yes. Yeah, so, so the short answer is, uh, the short answer is yes and no. So you may think, well, yes and no. What's he talking about? Here, here, here's the longer version. So I don't know her, uh, Delo uh, the woman you mentioned. Um, so I can't speak, uh, you know, for, you know, for her work and so forth. But there's, there is, yes, there is good work out there. Okay, the no is don't be, don't just be blind about it. There's, don't just go on YouTube. I have so many clients. Um, I actually teach an afterlife and reincarnation class. I have another one starting in January. I'm, the, I'm finishing one up now. I do it over a 12 week period every other week. So it's six, it's a six part series. Um, and uh, you can go on my website and, and you can refer some people that, there and they can check it out. I do a half minute, I mean a half, half minute, <laughs> a half an hour of video, <laughs> which is, uh, you can speed it up to half a minute. No. Uh, a half an hour video explaining what I talk about in the, in the, 12, in, in the six part series over the 12 weeks. But here's the but, and that's why I said the no, is that I have so many clients who get so confused because they go on YouTube and it's all over the map. They hear so many uh, theories and so forth and so on. And so what I recommend, here's the short recommendation I recommend if you're talking to somebody is to filter things through the consistency filter. What do I mean by that? Is the person consistent with what they say or do they make illogical jumps sometimes? And if they do, that's a red flag, okay? That's either a red flag, they don't know what they're talking about uh, and or they're just repeating and parroting somebody, what somebody else thought uh, they, they, they heard that somebody said and they th thought they knew what they were talking about, but they don't. And so these things, the afterlife, reincarnation, my experience, just a quick thing on this. Um, I have started opening up to my reincarnation, my past life memories. They go back 6,000 years in 1977. So you do the math, it's a long time ago. And so I, it, it just has opened up a lot. I have a book written about this and it, I'm still editing it. You know, I'm in the final editing of it. I just have been teaching so much. I haven't had time to go back. I have four books all pretty much at the same stage. That's one of them. Um, and then I started opening up and communicating with the other side um, in 1986. And then again, I don't do, I'm not a medium. So there are many mediums out there and there's, some of them are good and some of them are not good. And again, you need to filter. So if, if you, people ask you about that and communicating with loved ones and so forth. But again, the filtration is got to, are they consistent? Do they say things that are illogical sometimes that don't make any sense? You, you, you walk away from those people. So um, it's no different from on this side, actually, right? You go to the dry cleaner and the dry cleaner gives you some wacky advice. And, you know, you talk to somebody who's more knowledgeable in the field of healthcare, and you go, I think I'm going to go with the person who actually studied medicine, you know, or whatever, than my dry cleaner. It's no different. It's the same filtration method we use. But people tend to drop that filtration when they start getting information from the other side. It's for some reason, people all of a sudden, they lose their common sense and they don't filter. So I just encourage people to filter, filter, filter. I have a question if I can. Yes. How do you, I would love to be able to go to the other side like you say you're working on. Yeah. How do you develop that skill 
and what's going to be the title of your book about that? What was the last thing you said, James? Just what's the title of your book about that topic? Of, oh, of going you know, to the I other have, side or film? Yeah, I haven't decided. That's going to be probably part of my memoirs because I'm going to unfold the, my past life memories in the context of what started happening when I was two years old. When I was playing my, so quick story on that, uh, my, my aunts told me this when I was a teenager that I had, I didn't even know this, James, that when I was two years old, I used to go to my grandparents' house because my mother was the eldest, she was the first children and so forth, got married first. And, uh, and my, my aunts were in junior high school and high school, so they were still home, right? So I had to go over and I'm the one or two year old baby. They would fawn over, you know, oh, I take care of, oh, you know. You know, when, they, when you're in junior high and high school, you know, oh, babysitter, babysitter, that whole thing. Those of you who have children that age, you know what I'm talking about. And so they would tell me I would play in the living room with my invisible friends, and, and, and I would describe my invisible friends to them. I don't remember this. I still don't remember this. I squashed it. They told me this when I was a teenager, okay? But my point is that I'm going to go back to that, James, and I'm going to come to present. And so I'm just, I call it my memoirs and some of the other experiences that I've had in life that um, point out some consistencies in my personality that have continued through different incarnations. So that's why I'm going to, I'm not just going to talk about, oh, I had this reincarnation experience. I'm going to talk about some personality traits that I have and that people have observed in me. There's lots of people who know me over the last 69 years, you know. So, um, that, that, so I don't know what I'm going to call that. But how to open up. Your question, how to open up to the other side. Well, uh, one key way, and the, first of all, there's no guarantees, James, right? There's no guarantees. We don't know, you know, but what, it's probabilities. How can we increase the probability, the likelihood that we can open up? First, it's turning within. That's why I call my meditation technique turning within. It's about us turning within inside, connecting with ourselves as deeply and as easily as possible because that expands our mind outside of this uh, conscious, you think, focusing part of a mind that we're on the zoo, Zoom together with right now, right? And so we need to expand our conscious capacity. That's what gets us more in touch with the more expanded, different vibratory field that you're as aspiring to connect with. Does that make sense, logically? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a short answer. I, I already... Meditate. I have meditated for a long time, but I, I've Good. never been able to to tap into that. Feel you know, free so. to re reach out to me privately. To, to just uh, okay. send me a message, and then we'll talk offline. Okay. Great. Yep. Kelvin, this is Sonia Iescas. Um, yes. Uh, Dolores Cannon um, is um, well. She was because she's no longer alive, okay. but she was the uh, best-selling author. Uh, on uh, past life regressionist ah. uh, who wrote multiple books about what she called the lost knowledge. Um, and she taught uh, a unique technique of hypnosis all over the world. Um, and she specialized in past life therapy since 1979. And she has put to, uh, some books together that are are really amazing to read and you really have to have a very open mind to read that because it's like one of the things that caught my attention about what you said was when I asked the question about you know my client being angry because she can't get a sign from God that he's right. with her right. and, and you said well when they're on the other side they are busy doing things you know uh, they're not, we, we just don't transition into another dimension and we float around, you know, right. you know, we go through this process. There's this process that is described from what we do. And then we get, for those, who, for those of us who believe in reincarnation, and then we go through this process and then we make a decision when we're going to come back and right. what are we supposed to achieve when we come back. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, you may want to just take a look at some of her stuff because it's very much in line with what you are yeah. talking about and some of your personal experiences. Yes, yes. You, now that you mentioned her name and your the, the past life regression, I, I, I recognize her name. Thank you for saying that. Yes. And, and so past life regression is a way, and some past life regressionists are very good at it 
And it's like anything, there are good doctors, there are not so great doctors, there are better doctors and so forth. Same thing with past life regression is, I've never done past life regression myself because I just spontaneously started opening up in 1977. And I have 25 different lifetimes that I have memories from over the last 6,000 years. So it's just for me, everything that I teach and, and come from is, is from my own personal experience, not so much reading other people's stuff, uh, but it's my personal experience and my interpretation of them and to in trying to make sense of it again in a consistent fashion because my experience is that there is consistency here and there and the reincarnation process this all this this there's all manner of consistency lot might say consistency logical stuff that makes sense to us but thank you for that sonia kelvin thank you so much uh this is sharon i know we're going on the 431 um hour right. here um, just wanted to really thank you so much for, for coming in and, uh, being here today. Um, we do do meditation here with James. He's one of our beloved volunteers. Uh, and Dan does some meditation. I head up some meditation, but we would love to learn your turning within uh, meditation. Yeah, I'm a big believer in whatever meditation James, you, Dan are doing. It's awesome. You're leading meditation groups. It's awesome. Um, just a quick uh, 30 second on the te technique that I teach. So uh, I am offering, I said this to Sharon earlier before, um, to teach you all for free. Um, uh, we have a fee in my nonprofit and so forth where people pay, but it depends on what country you're from and so forth. You know, Bangladesh, they only make $2,000 a year. So, um, so, but I'm offering to teach any of you who want to learn my, my technique that I've been teaching for 47 years um, for free. Uh, just as a gift to you, basically. Um, and it's a four-day class. It's about an hour and a half each day. The first day is an hour, but the other days will probably run about an hour and a half. And, um, and just if you're interested, contact Sharon or Dan or somebody, one of your core, uh, you know, organizers there, and they'll let me know and we'll figure it out. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. It's a pretty good deal. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelvin. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. You're very yes, welcome. Yes, and how and how can people get in touch with you uh, for your book? Is it Overcoming the Fear of Death? Yeah, probably, org? The, probably the the easiest thing for people to do is just you remember you see my name, Kelvin Chin. Just stick a KelvinChin.org at the end. That's my nonprofit. Org KelvinChin.org. That will connect you to all of my websites easily from that one website. And then, um, and it'll explain how the technique, the meditation technique is very different from mindfulness. And uh, it's very easy. I've actually taught Buddhist monks my meditation technique. So there's no conflict with other techniques, but it's very different. It's much easier. There's no clearing of the mind. There's no focusing on the breath. There's no concentration or any of that. So you'll, you'll read about that. Just kelvinchin.org is probably the easiest place to just access everything. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's great to be with everybody. And I hope you can, and, and people should know you want to reach out to me privately for a, you know, no charge phone session, shoot me, uh, either you, if you have my email address, shoot me an email or just go to kelvinshin.org, go to the contact page and send me a uh, message. Okay. Thank All you. right. Great. Thank Take you. care. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. You're Thanks, welcome. Sharon. Thank, thank you. you. See you, James. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Take care. I think I am eating my stuff. Yeah, just